Her name is Mika Morris, and she's one of the up-and-coming stars in the sports business world. And if you still don't know who she is, well, don't worry, you will. Hello, everyone. This is Jabari Young, senior writer here at Forbes. And in a minute, I'll be talking to the Minnesota Twins chief business officer, Mika Morris. She was the first chief revenue officer in team history. We're talking about her journey and how she got to where she is today, being a star, being the daughter of a former Boston Celtics star, Jojo White, all that and more with Mika Morris, the Minnesota Twins chief business officer right now. So Mika Morris, last time we spoke, the baseball season was just beginning. And now as we sit here, the Twins are in first place. Uh, it has to feel good. And, and let me know, how's business when a team is in first place? I mean, the, the money must be coming through the door. <laughs> um, it, it isn't quite that simple, but yeah. it certainly is a heck of a lot better than it would be if, uh, if, we, if the alternative were true. I mean, I'm proud that we're in first place and have done so with bats that have been a little bit cold you know we're we're playing some 50 50 ball we're just at 500 and you know baseball's a long season though we haven't even hit the, the middle of the the road yet so we got a ways to go but uh it feels good no doubt but it's coming though i mean listen we're right we're the all-star we're break right you there. know we're right there yeah if we can uh kind of heat things up um you know coming out of the all-star break i think that we may find ourselves in a pennant race to the end which is is the best time uh, to, to watch baseball uh, without question. Yeah. You know, your story is is such a, a unique one. Uh, I remember when we met a few months back in 2023 at the Black Sports, the Black Sports Business Symposium um, in Atlanta, and it was such a thrill to see so many uh, black women on stage representing, you know, various clubs across the sports, um, you know, the Raiders and the Cavs, and, and then there was you at the Minnesota Twins. And you're the first chief revenue officer uh, for that organization. And people may look back and say, oh, my God, what took so long? But still, here you are. There's nothing wrong with being the first, but but here you are. How's that transition since, you know, June 2021 to till now? How's it been? It's been great. Um, you know, I, I always say as people sort of think about navigating their career and, you know, I, I if you'd asked me 20 plus years ago, did I think I'd end up in Minnesota at the Twins? The answer would have been been no. But you know what? This is why you got to let your career play out um, mm. and understand kind of how and what you want to ultimately do and where's the best place to do it. And, and ownership and leadership is um, paramount in our business. Um, you know, much bigger, broader organizations, there's a lot of sort of layers between you and the CEO. If you think about big brands like Target or big brands like Nike even. Um, but when you talk about a sports team, it, it really is a relatively medium sized to small business. And so who sits at the helm, what they stand for, you know, have, having shared ethos, shared passion, things that align is is, is critical. And that's not going to always be in, you know, your hometown. Um, sometimes it can be, but but not not always. And so I've been really blessed to be here in Minnesota under the leadership of of the Polad family and Dave St. Peter, who have been every bit of what they said they were. They believe and stand up for things that are right, and they believe in me, um, and give me the latitude to do the job that I came here to do, which which is uh, makes it all that more special. Yeah, and we're going to get into that. You know, talk about you getting to the Minnesota Twins and all that you went through to get there. Um, but for, for those people who may not know, right? For those people who are tuning in and and they watch the Forbes videos, but now when they watch it, Mika Morris pops up on their screen, right? And they say, well, who is Mika Morris outside of the, we know you're the chief revenue, chief business officer of the Minnesota Twins because you were promoted chief revenue first and then one of a retirement happened and now you're chief business officer. So revenue falls under your department now. Um, yep. Who is Mika Morris? How, how would you describe yourself to someone who you wouldn't know, know you? I am your, your, you know, next door, everyday black girl. Yeah. I am. Um, you know, grew up in Boston, uh, grew up in an, a fairly athletic family, went to college at the University of Kansas, a proud Jayhawk, you know, had dreams of working in sports, but re didn't really understand how. And, you know, with, with a lot of luck, a lot of prayer and uh, some really supportive people along the way, made my way uh, into this industry and have continued to grow. Um, but I, you know, and me, I, I, I rock sneakers, I drink old fashions, I listen to hip hop, I have soft locks in my hair. Um, tomorrow it may be something different, but you know, I think being the full extent of who you are and, and making sure that you work in a place that allows for that and celebrates that is important. And that wasn't always the case. And so I'm proud to say it is today and something that 
um, you know, makes me feel whole and makes me know that I can do every bit of the work I came to do, but do it by being every bit of who I'm called to be. Yeah. You know, I, I thought the, 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 the sneakers and I thought like, I'm not going to front. When I saw you first, you had the Jordan threes on, if I'm not mistaken, right? Those the white Jordan threes. Uh-huh. And as yeah. we talk, I see the big picture in the back of you. And I'm thinking to myself, you know what? She is a sneaker head. And then I had a chance to talk to the owner, Joe Polat, about you uh, and Dave. Same, and they both said, you know what? That's real. She wears sneakers around the office. It's it, it's a cultural thing. Like It's, it's not, nothing to be ashamed of when you do it. But did that take some getting used to like, all right, you know, let me I got to feel comfortable rocking these sneakers because, again, you come from such a unique background. And you want to make a good impression. Yeah. You know, you start out really trying to to buy into to what you think you're supposed to be. And yeah. I think I spent the first decade of my career believing that wearing full suits and, you know, heels and, and, and everything in between to try to fit into what I, I thought you needed to be to be. Um, you know, a respected and, and um, executive in, in the industry of sports and entertainment. And then I think you get to this place where you just say to yourself, they can accept me for who I who I am and, and how I rock, then it's not the place for me. And so once you step into that space, not just from a fashion sense, um, from a personal perspective, but from an ideological mindset, everything about my career shifted. The trajectory, you know, how I moved, the relationships I was able to build because people want authenticity. People want you to be you. Um, and, and the genuineness that comes across when you are every bit of that matters. And it matters not just in the internal relationships, but certainly the external ones. And so, you know, I don't always wear sneakers, but I, I, I'd argue about 80% of the time, whether I got a suit or a dress on or anything else, I probably got a pair of J's on or, you know, whatever else might be in my closet. Yeah. It's easier to wear it in the summertime, right? Because now you're in a sport where, you know, it's beautiful weather outside all the time. So it's like you might get a chance to show some great ones. Whereas if it was wintertime, you would probably not wear them as much because you have to walk through the snow and the slush. Well, yeah, but you know what? I mean, listen, people, you know, Minnesota gets this bad rap about about the winter and, and it is Mega, cold. That's not a bad winter. rap. I've been to Minnesota. It's, it's cold. OK, it's it cold, is. It's cold in Chicago. It's, it's cold. Long. But one, they have found a way to embrace it in ways that I didn't even think were possible. But two, they also have tunnels everywhere. So yeah. I go from garage to garage. I mean, the amount of time I spend outside walking through the snow is very, very, very little. So, yeah, I mean, I, I wear some sneakers in the winter, but you got your, your boots on and, you know, you make it you make it hot no yeah. matter how and what the winter or weather looks like. So yeah. I try to keep up. Yeah, but just better to wear. When you go to the ballpark at nighttime, that was great. Have you been complimented yet? Has somebody stopped you and said, hey, you're Mika Morris. They, they go to Jays. Has that happened yet? Oh, my God. All the time. Wow. Um, you know, and I have some, you know, exclusives. I think I wore uh, some some uh, powder blue North Carolina threes um, and I got stopped a whole bunch with those on. You know, there's the ones that you're like, those can't come out unless the weather there's no rain. There's no precipitation whatsoever because these cannot get wet. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I think and, and it, sometimes it's complimenting me on the shoes themselves. But a lot of times it's it's just about owning your your personal style like you know just how you show up and and that people can recognize that you're showing up as you and it's it's like unlike anybody else i think people just that just really resonates with people across the board absolutely absolutely well listen you know let's start from the beginning you grew up in boston uh your dad and i'm glad you didn't mention it off the top because when i asked you who Mika morris was you went and you talked about yourself but your dad you know he was jojo white you know played for the boston celtics for a long time um, and, you know, here you are growing up in Boston and you're in an athletic household. Um, mm-hmm. is, is that where that fire and that competitiveness, is it arrived from that, that your dad was, was an athlete himself? Without question. Yeah. You know, my brother played in the NFL for a number of years. You know, in my house, there were six of us. What and, team? Uh, uh, for the New England Patriots. Yeah. And uh, you competed for everything. I mean, I, if we were, you know, for – the, the last piece of chicken, jacks, <laughs> tiddlywinks, bowling, horseshoes, volleyball. I mean, it was intense all the time because we had a house full of athletes and competition sort of reigned supreme. And yeah. so, you know, for me growing up, you know, if you didn't, if you couldn't win, uh, <laughs> there wasn't a whole lot of gets you were getting, right? So, you know, it was it was fun, but, you know, you, you found your edge, you know, 
you were smaller than everybody, you moved different. You know, you're bigger than everybody, you could push people around. I mean, it was just the way we grew up. And so I think that put some fire in my belly. I think competition just is a part of me. It's probably why I got into sales. It's, you know, I didn't, I don't, you know, what resonates with me is this ability to compete regardless of age, tenure, or what you look like. If you're selling, either you sold it or you didn't. Either you're selling more than, than him or her or you're not. Um, where other, I think, facets of, of industry don't give you as clear cut um, sort of ability to rack and stack as drive and revenue does. And I think that definitely comes from how I grew up and in, in being in a home where there's a lot of athletes competing all the time. Yeah. But, you know, th your path was so different because you could have followed. You see a lot of athletes who, you know, come up in, in athletic households. They follow their parents. They go into sports to try to be the player. But here you are. You went to University of Kansas. You mentioned you ran track and field. You, you, you know, I don't, you didn't play basketball, um, but you went into sales. Like, where did that passion for sales come in at, especially since it, it, one would think you would drive to basketball because that's what your dad yeah. would? You know, I, I don't know that anybody, at least then, um, sort of wakes up and says, gosh, I just want to be a salesperson. I think it always gets a negative connotation um, around it. And I think for me, again, you know, uh, while I ran track, I, I knew that wasn't going to be a sustainable long-term career. You know, I wasn't going to be an Olympian or the next Allison Fe Felix or, or um, anybody for that matter. So it was like, okay, what's next? This industry that I love, how do I stay adjacent to it, work within it? but knew that I didn't want to, I wasn't going to play and I didn't really want to coach. Um, but, no, but no one really talked about what happens on the other side. And so um, as I started to, to sort of learn and study and, and, and grow, you know, and thought like most people do, yeah, I'd love to be in marketing and, and what does that mean and trying to define what that meant. You know, and, and they started to talk about career path and trajectory. Again, the competitive spirit in me is like, okay, so I'm going to be a marketing coordinator and they're going to hire four. And basically, whoever's been here is the longest is the one that's going to get the next sort of manager job. But like, what if I'm working harder than him? Or what if I'm, you know, doing more than her? And it just really didn't matter as much. And so I was looking for something that had a little bit more black and white, like where the effort in equaled the, the, the effort out. Where if I put in the time and did the small things and went the extra mile and was willing to grind and willing to perfect, that it would show and pay dividends in the results of what I delivered. And it, and it found its way into sales, which was the clearest cut way where your effort in really you know, increased the propensity of your results out. And I think from there, it just was game on. You know, I'm sitting next to, you know, at the time, 20 other men and women out of school and it's like the cream rises to the top and so how i work and how i show up has the ability to define the outcome and the trajectory of my career and i just took that and parlayed it ever since so you majored in sales and marketing in school or was it something else that drove you to no, sales? i majored in um strategic communications i got mm. a degree in journalism i mm. thought i was going to be a sideline reporter and be like the next hannah storm or robin roberts or you know, Rachel Nichols, uh, that's what I wanted to do. And then, you know, did that for some time and quickly realized that being on camera and being on all day, you know, just wasn't for me. Some of the lifestyle and things that you had to do to get get stories and, and show up um, and chase around, you know, athletes that sometimes want to participate and sometimes don't just wasn't didn't speak to who I was and wasn't a career that I could see myself in for the next 20, 30 years, but I still wanted to be in sports. And so this was kind of my way into that without kind of going down that journalism sort of sideline reporter route. Yeah. And after you got out of journalism, you end up where? I ended up um, at a small uh, uh, advertising uh, um tech company in Boston that I did for a handful of months before I got my very first job in sports at the Cleveland Cavaliers mm -hmm. in their inside sales program. And that was around what year? That was probably in 0304. 0304. Okay. Special time yeah. of the year for, for the Cavs at that point, right? As you transition yeah. from the ad world into back into sports full time, what are you learning? What, what, what are you, where are you at mentally? Um, it's hard. I mean, at that time, those, those, those jobs were coveted. There was only so many at every team. Um, they paid very little and you ate what you killed. And so I had to really grind it out and find a way to make 
you know, sales happen. Um, and, and, and I did that and I did it, um, in rapid fashion. Um, I think I was, you remember your first one, your first sale where you went home, drunk an old fashioned was like, I did it. I don't know that I could afford or was drinking old fashioned <laughs> at that time, but, um, you know, it was, uh, I mean, back then you, you, you know, computers weren't, weren't as prevalent. So you had a phone and a phone book and they give you a list of previous buyers who might have bought single game tickets and you just dialed and smiled for dollars mm. and you'd call people and try to convince them to buy Cavalier season tickets over the phone. Um, and they gave you a host of training to be able to do that. And they just, you know, let you go. And you and, you know, I, it might have been 30, 40 other people in a war room just hitting the phones and, and trying to make sales and close sales. And, you know, I was the first woman that they ever promoted into a sales, uh, a senior level sales role at the Cleveland Cavaliers. It was, you know, incredible honor, but I, I, I worked my tail off for that. Absolutely. Um, you know, early mornings, late nights, staying and working through lunch, trying to find my edge, trying to find people who were, you know, potential buyers, working those potential buyers to see if they had other people they knew that would be interested in season tickets. That is, in my opinion, the hardest job in sports because you are going to hear no more than you hear yes. The amount of people who hang up on you, the ability to encourage yourself, dig deep and find another another level to come back the next day and pick up the phone again, even though nobody said yes yesterday and nobody said yes the day before and other people are making sales and you're watching them and, and you're not making any and the discouragement, but then the mental toughness to stay in there. I think it lends itself so perfectly to the same experience you have playing playing a sport or being an athlete. Absolutely. You got to stay in there, as you said, mentally grind it out. And, and in a season, it's long. You go through your ebbs and flows and you still got to put on a smile at the end of the day. And I'm glad you saw and you mentioned all the things that journalists have to go through because when I was covering the Spurs, believe me, I tell people, you know how much I hated having to stand there and wait for players to come out of the locker room after they want to get warm. I mean, they want to lift weights after the game, take a shower, smell good, get dressed, try to wait the media out as long as possible, and then they come out. And by that point, it's 11.45 at night. The game is long long over but again right. you do what you got to do well and the other part to that too is you, you're waiting and you're waiting whether they won or lost yes so the attitude of and they're human right so they have a bad day they had a bad game and now you got to get a statement from somebody who really doesn't want to talk to you mm -hmm. they tried to wait you out here they come after a tough loss and you've got to engage them into a conversation they really don't want to have about something they really want to forget um and if if you don't get them engaged, you know, it can affect the story that you put out the next day. There's a lot of pressure there. Absolutely. And you get one moment to succeed and your ability to continue to succeed over time is the difference between, you know, your career trajectory versus another. Yeah. And it's very similar to how it works in sales. It'll make me cry. Uh, thank you for not rec recognizing the job. I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, listen, from 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 the Cleveland Cavaliers on your resume, uh, a whole bunch of jobs. You know, you, you were with the, the Hornets as well, uh, Legends, Live Nation, the Raiders. Um, out of all of those jobs, you know, before going to tap it and then eventually, you know, landing with the Minnesota Timberwolves, excuse me, the Minnesota Twins, what what would you say that stop that really changed your your trajectory in your career? Because I know there was a point in time you also said you felt invisible. You were hitting your numbers. Yeah. Everything was happening for you. You were grinding. You found your niche. But what job would you say really kind of changed the pace for you and, and allowed you to excel? Yeah, it was uh, without question when I went to work with Legends in New York. Mm. And the reason was because I finally, for the first time, had somebody in the senior level leadership team who advocated for me. Who, who was that? Me. Her name is Nicole Jeter West, mm. currently the CEO of Underdog. Um, at the time, she was the chief marketing officer of Legends. And I had people in my past who would say they looked out for me, would say that they had my back. But when, you know, push came to shove and the rubber met the road, they never promoted me. They never recommended me. The big jobs would come and go. And I'd be standing there and no one would even acknowledge or even offer me up as a potential fit. And for the first time in my career, for the first time in, you know, I was seen. I had somebody who saw me and not because they had to, but because they wanted to. 
and tried and helped me and groomed me and exposed me and put me in the room and spoke the things in the room when I wasn't able to be in the room myself on my behalf that got me opportunities to stretch and grow beyond what what I thought was possible and, and frankly in some ways beyond what I was at the time qualified for but 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 stood in the gap and helped fill the gap on my behalf and and I think that was the turning point, not just because I got some exposure and some stretch in my career, but because I finally saw somebody who saw in me what I'd seen in myself. And I'll never forget it. And I will never not do that for somebody else. Yeah. And when did you realize that she was on your side? Was it something that somebody said or, or did you just see it? It was it was we she and I went I, maybe to lunch or we caught up and she had come over to our office at the time we were in one world trade center and I started to talk to her about, you know, my career growth and what I wanted. And she immediately just says, you know, you can do that job and here's how, and here's how I'm going to help you understand what it's going to take. And it wasn't me coaxing her. It was her pulling me. And I'm a firm believer that rising tides lift all boats. And, you know, when, you, when you're climbing, you've got to pull while you climb. And she could have easily sort of not. But as she's climbing, she's pulling and climbing um, at the same time. And I don't think, you know, we do that often enough um, because you're so focused on self or you've been so beat down by others that they thought of pulling somebody else up even if they may have trajectory or loft beyond you seems inconceivable, but it was selfless on her behalf. Yeah. Um, and for that, I'll ever, forever be grateful. Yeah. Yeah. And then you go from legends into tap it, right? I go from legends to Learfield, Learfield, Learfield. And then from Learfield to tap it. Correct. And then at tap it, you know, you spend a little bit of time there that, you know, great it, uh, software system that they, you know, help uh, sell uh, for, for teams and stadiums. And then obviously the Minnesota Twins come knocking at your door, right? Joe, Joe Polet, uh, you know, uh, Dave St. Peter, they come knocking at your door. And in talking to Joe, I asked him, I said, you know, what stood out about Mika? And he said it was her aggressiveness, right? And Joe usually didn't hire people who were aggressive because he wanted leaders who were patient. But here you are, aggressive. And he looks at Dave St. Peter after you spoke and after he met you to talk about this job. And he says, that's that's the one right there. That's our one. And I said, Joe, you but you don't really like aggressive leaders. And he says, yes, but we needed somebody who we didn't do things the, the, the way that she saw it. We did things differently the way or, or the viewpoint was different. We needed somebody in the room who wasn't like us. And here you are. Right. When you found out or they offered you that job, what made you say yes? Other than the money. Yeah, money money never is the reason anyone should say yes to anything. Yeah. Money should never lead. It should always follow because money doesn't doesn't fill me. It's not my why. Um, what made me say yes was Joe and Dave. Um, you know, at the time, um, you know, we're post George Floyd, post Me Too, coming, you know, on the heels of COVID and. And let's be right about it. I don't know that there was a team in sports and entertainment or or property in sports and entertainment that wasn't looking for people of color or women yeah. to fill leadership roles. It was sort of on on trend at that time, right? And so there was a lot of options I had at that particular juncture. But for me, having been through what I've been through and worked all the, the, the amazing places I have, who leads and who you hit your wagon to is beyond paramount more so than the job and the money. Yeah. Um, because you've got to know that they stand for the things you stand for and that they see and believe in you, the things that you see and believe in yourself. And they're going to give you the latitude to do the work. And when I kept pressing this idea of I am outspoken, I am going to um, not stand by and allow things to just continue as they were. I'm going to challenge you and ask tough questions and not just to be a contrarian, but because I need to make sure we are not doing what we've always done because we've always done it, but that we're doing what we need to do to move the business forward, even if that means us changing what we've always been. Yeah. And when I kept re, you know, reintroducing that idea, they kept double downing on the idea that they were ready and that they needed 
what I was going to bring to the table. They needed somebody who was going to see it from fresh eyes. They needed somebody who wasn't from Minnesota and wasn't going to see it the way all you know contemporaries had or others had in the past. And not just as a as a mechanism to sort of ignite you know controversy, but as an opportunity to sort of look at the situation from fresh eyes and ultimately shift how we do things in a way that helps us grow. And they have been that, they continue to be that, and they continue to push me to continue to have those conversations, even though sometimes I know they've been hard to take. Um, because, you know, look, they, they've built this business. I mean, Dave has built been here 30 some odd years. I mean, this is personal. Um, and when somebody comes in and, and, and has things to say, um, that can be taken as such, but he believes and knows that it is never personal. I'm always here about how we get better um, as a team, and it is as much on me as it is on him today. And together we will get where we need to go. Yeah, and here you are now, first chief business chair, first chief revenue officer, turned now chief business officer of the Minnesota Twins. Um, and I'm sure this, it sounds like an exciting job. Every time I look at execs that are running around in C-suite levels in sports, I'm always envious. See, you guys have the best jobs, right? I know you said it's not about money, but still, we are in America, so money does play a part. It can't be the reason, as you say, but it does play a part. And yeah. you get a chance to watch some of the greatest sports, and you get a ring if they win. Like, you know, that that's a great win-win. I mean, I couldn't agree more. You know, I, <laughs> listen, I look over my shoulder at Target Field. Yeah. Where, I mean, this is my office, and I... You know, the days where it's hard and the days where, you know, we're struggling or things aren't going the way we want. I just turn my chair around and I look out and I say, you know what? How lucky am I that this is what I get to wake up and do every day. This is what I'm talking about every day that I get to meet people like you and many others who are interested in what we do that watch our games or our sports as a pastime or go to our concerts or shows to enjoy time with people. Sports has this way. It, it, it's it's like this 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 magic right like you and i can be jabari so different we can be from different places speak different languages eat different food have different religion we can as different as the day is long but when we all step out at the twins game we're all cheering we're all in it together and for those two and a half hours you forget everything that makes us different and you enjoy everything that makes us the same and music and sports have the ability to unite people in a way that many things don't don't have today. Yeah. Um, and you see it. I see it when I look out and see crowds of people who are from various pockets of this city and they're in it together, high fiving and cheering for each other. And that just there's very few things left in this life that that bring people together in the way that sports and music does. And so I'm proud of the work, but I'm also feel lucky. Yeah. Lucky and blessed that I was sort of given this gift to be and lead in this industry. Two things before hopping into the actual business and going over your role before I get you out of here. The first is, did you wear Jordans on the interview? I did not. Ah, I did not so there is Jordan. a line, huh? <laughs> there, there, there is ish. It's, yeah. You know what? Had I worn a suit on my interview, I probably would have. But I didn't. I wore a dress and it just wasn't appropriate. But yeah. I am not opposed. Trust me, I'm not opposed. Yeah, it's acceptable. Like I said, it's acceptable. And and before you took that job, remember, you know, this in 2021, we're coming off of so much social unrest in 2020 and you were in the hot spot. It's Minnesota was in a resistance. Did you say, you know what? No, so much has happened there. I don't want to come into that role because, again, there was a trend of hiring black people. I hope it, is, it didn't fall off. I hope that's still a trend. But yeah. even I asked Joe and Dave St. Peter, hey, did you hire her just because she was a black woman? They both said no. They loved your, you know, your credentials and your attributes. But you personally inside, did you feel like, you know what, I don't want to go that route because it's Minnesota. It's a hot spot. You know what? I am. Um, it's such a great question because, I mean, anybody who says that it didn't matter would be lying. I mean, I'm coming into the belly of the beast, so to speak, the spark that sort of ignited a nation around the disparity that exists then and still does for, for people of color and specifically black folks. Um, but the obstacle is the way. If you're gonna make real change in any facet of your life, you are going to have to jump in the fire and go you know, into 
the lion's den, so to speak. And if, if there was ever a place to make change for people who look like me, doing it in baseball in Minnesota, I can't think of a better combination of things that can drive real change for, for, for people of color and black women in sports and entertainment. And so, you know, I, I, I don't shy away from the challenge. I actually think the challenge is what builds character. And it'd be easier for me to have gone and worked in basketball in Atlanta as an, as an option or whatever the case may be. But what's easy isn't always where you're going to do your best work and where you're going to grow the most. Absolutely. And so I always encourage young people, in particular p- people of color, we always sort of box ourselves into, well, I will only work in L.A., Atlanta, New York, and Chicago, or I would never go work in this sport, or I'd never work in hockey, or I never, and it's like all of the barriers that you put up for yourself are the barriers that other people put up against you. Like we've got to break out of this notion that we can only be successful in a market that looks a certain way. Like if you can go be successful in the, in the exact opposite of that, the the other stuff is easy. Yeah, absolutely. Going into the Twins now, you're a $1.3 billion franchise, and I was talking to Joe and Dave about this. They felt like it was unfair. They don't want to put numbers on you, but there are markets that they'd like to emulate. And, you know, naming rights, the jersey patch, there are things that they are expecting you to get done. Because at the end of the day, you know, they love having you, but your job is to drive revenue. What's the secret? How are you going to do it? You know, what I appreciate about Dave and Joe is there's a lot of ways we drive revenue, right? I oversee multiple business lines and and there's pieces and parts to all of it. Um, you know, it, it's not, uh, all money isn't good money, right? And so while we, it is so critical that we hit our, our, our targets and we are well on pace and above pace um, on those for this calendar year, or um, however, who matters? And it matters to me and it matters to the organization. And, you know, we've engaged plenty of people relative to a jersey patch. And, you know, there's a lot of companies and brands out there we could go down a path with. But when we tattoo a logo to the side of our jersey, who is on that logo, what that company represents, and how they're ultimately going to impact this community really matters. And so, again, this goes back to do we have a shared ethos as a leadership team from the outset? If you're looking for me to just slang a deal with no care or regard for the community we serve and who the brands are, we're not aligned from the beginning. And so there is always and continues to be alignment there. Um, There is a lot of ways to drive um, this business forward. There are some marquee assets, no doubt, but again, you can't unsee what's seen. You put a, you do a, 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 a lackluster deal, not not maybe financially lackluster, but the brand and the how it resonates with the community and what it means is short of what we want. You can't unsee that patch on that jersey. So we've got to be really intentional about who we put there. Just like the name on a building, you and I don't need to recall, but there's countless naming rights of buildings that we've all been like. In what world would you ever <laughs> put that name yeah. on that building? Like, it's not. Or, a good is that an example of teams chasing the money when they do that? I, I do. I, I do think we get in a habit of, of chasing the check, and and I get why. Listen, it costs a lot to run a sports franchise. The player salaries aren't going down. Executive salaries aren't going down. But when you chase the check, whether it's for your own personal job, for you know revenue goals for a team. Um, it, it, the result of that can oftentimes be worse than the check you cashed. Yeah. And so there has to be the middle. The, the best check you can get coupled with the best brand and relationship you can get. And I think we as an organization have been on a mission to make sure that those two things are coupled without yeah. question. Um, and I and I know if, if Dave and Joe were sitting here in this room would say the same. And so... There's things that I've brought to them and deals that we've said no to because they don't align with the moral compass of this organization. And I respect that the Polad family and Joe have always rested on what is right. And it doesn't matter how big the check is. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, we got to let you get back to making the money and getting the checks. Before I let you get out of here, we have a great platform. We just launched Forbes BLK. Um, and that community is a lot of, uh, you know, black women that, that represent the membership. And, um, you know, I always said I always want to represent them. They might reach out to you because I want you to tell them if they're looking for a career in sports or maybe listening to you now, they think about heading in that direction. What do you tell young black women, young women of color about how to thrive, how to navigate the sports world so that one day they can be maybe where you're sitting at? Um, not one day they will be, mm. um, because my, my career is, is staked on that. You know, I, I don't want people to get to where I am. I want people to get past where I am in a much rapid, more rapid fashion than I. Um, but what I would say is don't be afraid to take risks. You know, the, the right opportunity under the right leader for you may be at the Minnesota Twins in Minneapolis. And if you're a young woman on, you know, on a coast or or in a major city who's saying, hey, you know, I really want to stay in name your city, you may be missing out on the exact right opportunity that's going to expose you to the most and grow you um, at the quickest rate. And so if you really want this, nothing worth having is not worth sacrificing something for. And if you think it's going to be easy and it's going to be comfortable, it's not going to be. And so I, I would say the reason I'm here where I am today is because I took risks and took them early. You know, when, my, when I told my parents I wanted to go to Cleveland from Boston to go work for the Cavaliers for very little money, they looked at me and said, I mean, who wants to move to Cleveland, Ohio? But if I hadn't gone to Cleveland, there is no doubt I wouldn't be sitting here today. Absolutely. Um, and that wasn't a popular choice, uh, you know, coming from Boston and coming from my family. So... You know, I think we got to be willing to take some risks and know that those risks, if you work hard, will pay off and, and they'll pay off in spades. Yeah, absolutely. And that way you can buy all the Jordans you want once they pay off. That, yeah. that part. <laughs> Mika Morris, the chief business officer of the Minnesota Twins. Thank you so much for the time. I look forward to continuing to know your journey as you evolve and uh, good luck the rest of the way. Stay healthy. Keep those bats hot. That's right. Thanks, Barry. Appreciate it.